read a new essay, which is probably about 85% done, meaning that it's got some problems, and I'm the first one to say that. This will talk about things that some of you who know my work will know about, but it's, I'm always trying to figure out ways to come back to the same themes and plumb them as if I were a jazz musician, which obviously I am not. Linwood. I had a brother, and that says it all, from a conversation overheard on a New York City bus. In my 60 years on this planet, I have known a fair number of miscreants. When I was young growing up in Harlem, there was a tough neighborhood bully who had killed someone in a brutal knifing, and he was well known and feared by all of us. Linwood was a bully, someone one might even call despotic, but that too seems uncharitable or patiently inaccurate, as a fuzzy appellation as helpful and historically anomalous as those grand numerals on the Lennox globe, here there be dragons. The world of Linwood was uncharted. The world of most of us in 1950s Harlem was one of ferocious intrigue and the evolvements. A world at hazard so constituted that most of us, however much we might deny it, were, in Gwendolyn Brooks' wonderful phrase, rising in a clear delirium. Most of us knew other tough kids, but their mythology, their street cred in today's parlance, was largely that. No one truly knew if John had stabbed a fat kid or if Frankie had smothered the pink-faced, scarecrow-looking vagabond, Rafe. But Linwood acts were verifiable. There were bodies. Indisputably, my neighborhood was unusually safe. Murders were as common as zebras or cobras on Wealthy Park Avenue. And when one did hear of one, it entered the pantheon of the phantasmagoric, which is why it held such imaginative sway. In my neighborhood, everyone who knew, to, knew who did the knifing, it was only the authorities who were perplexed. Coloreds like to kill each other. One of New York's finest was overheard confessing in a fit of candor. As he conducted the rigorous crime investigation, hauling in suspects who might have just as truthfully confessed to kidnapping the Lindbergh baby, their chances of committing this crime were that slim. One suspect was blind. He couldn't see a knife. The other, one of the neighborhood's true griots who had witnessed a comet strike a pharaoh's house in the third century, I was there, she kept repeating, was clearly insentient. Unfortunately, my brother Paul did witness murder when he was merely eight years of age, since it occurred in front of our brownstone a few feet from him. Paul seemed preternaturally selected for horrible encounters, and if anyone were called on the carpet for the smallest offense, whether he did it or not, or was to witness something no one should ever be consigned to see, it was he. And Paul seemed inevitably to attract the attention of the police. And for that reason, and a host of others less easy to enumerate, he hated them. When he was six years old, Paul was held by a policeman for two hours in a Drury police station for stealing money from someone four years his senior. Paul was no saint but he was not a thug at age six. I doubt if anyone truly is. At the time, Paul was going to the collegiate school, the oldest independent school in America, where I too languished, and he was doing well. And though he never liked the school and felt rightfully that it was the white boy's kingdom, his turn, which suggested Paul's undying confrontation with race with untold vexations, he was, the usual boyish amalgam, a bit randy on Monday, taciturn on Tuesday, studious on Wednesday and Thursday, and skittish on Friday. In his early years at the school, Paul easily made friends with the janitors and all the staff. They liked his easygoing camaraderie with them. They saw in his natural reticence a reservoir of respect, something that the other collegiate boys, used to having their way with princes and kings, rarely evidenced. Paul brought Simeon, the custodian, a book he thought he would like, 
and Simeon and his friends held a birthday party for my brother, replete with a piñata, which Paul attacked like a prize fighter. Paul was never more delighted. Paul, too, was very gifted at music, and he played the recorder well, often taking the instrument after a sunny stit like daring solo and hitting it tenderly against the music stand as he would later hit the skin of his drums, touching them lightly as a feather skims the surface of a pond. Here Paul characteristically was acting out. He would be a drummer, not a reed player, but he wouldn't state as much. You had to read his body. Yet I well recall my brother being brought home by his father after his time at the police station. How he was shamed by sitting among the dispossessed, envisioning what the world expected of him. My brother that age, only age six, moving slowly, vacantly, as if his spine had been infected with a deadly virus. Paul was literally half-stepping, his bones sidling against themselves as if his locomotion had been eviscerated. It might have been funny if one were not my brother. From that moment on, he detested the police. Paul, in truth, was oddly grafted to my family, as if the providential birth stork had somehow made a mistake and flew to the wrong house. When Paul was three, I recall him packing his bags and heading out of our Harlem residence with that grim determination that is the hallmark of children. Although the young often anticipate running away from home after some tiff, nothing palpable had occurred to occasion this departure. Paul was simply giving bodily testimony to something ineluctable, although it now hurts me to admit it. Characteristically, Paul did not belong to us. He was a night person. My parents and I were morning people. Paul was unusually quiet. We were story rich. Paul loved the streets. We were terrified by them. My parents, of course, did not permit Paul to leave. Although they let him walk 100 yards from our house, watching him from the window, just before he engaged the corner, and would become invisible, like Annie, a girl we had heard about who had, on a bright Sunday morning, simply disappeared, a notion as unusual and frightening in 1954 Harlem as seeing the giant sea coal on 77th Street, Riverside Park Field, a place where all of us would go to play softball on weekends, part of that orchestrated, high-minded overture to get the ghetto kids to see the greater New York. A miraculous hole so enterprising that one could witness the water running under the field like loosing fingers of quicksilver, as if the world above needed a busy subterranean terrarium. In the three years I watched the hole, it would grow larger and more menacing, brimming with bottles, potato chip bags, broken dolls, condoms, all rising like a demented volcano, and you could hear the water gurgling, the city seemingly alive, the first time I understood that the city was truly geologic, wondrous, nature-rich. Young Filbert, who had six fingers on one hand, five on the other, and had recently arrived from South Carolina, part of the Great Migration, said that even Annie might be in that hole. Young Filbert, who would later, on a simmering August day, slip into the Hudson River, head out towards the George Washington Bridge, swim farther than any of us could imagine, angle close to the mythic Little Red Lighthouse, and then head back to us, not damaged or deracinated, his body luminescent. Harlem in the 1950s, in the early spring, was lovely. And my mother, brother, and I would often walk from our house on 147th Street to 116th Street, trapsing down Broadway, welcoming the new bodegas, which seemed, in the glance of an eye, to appear everywhere. The Spanish lofting like a splendid aria, the young men with children proudly hoisting them on their shoulders like precious gifts, the zoot suitors already beginning the process of growing obsolete, up to less than good, never bothering us, the young men and the oldsters who saw my mother as beautiful, tipping their hats, a few of them with studied decorum saying, it's a beautiful day, a few of them watching my mother, then thin-hipped, a bit lustily, as she gracefully sauntered away. Harlem was a community of shared values, and I had a legion of family and would-be family. I was never unattended. Should my brother and I misbehave, Aunt Tina or Aunt Alvatine, neither of them blood relatives, though you dare not tell them that, would whip me. 
I was a child of 147th Street, and every adult on that street watched over me, and everyone had the right to set me straight. In truth, it must have been horrible for Paul, being placed amongst people as otherworldly as his family must have appeared. It wasn't that we didn't love him or he us. It was simply that we were incomprehensible to one another. Some of it possibly was that Paul was a fledgling musician. He would later become a good jazz drummer, playing at times with Carmen McRae. Some of it, just as truthfully, was that Paul, by desire and impulse, loved life, although he seemed to be doing everything imaginable to forswear it, be it with alcohol or pills. Some of it, quite simply, was human picadillo and the realization that our desire to have Paul live might yet require an alembic that we could not discern. Some of it, most powerfully, involves a truism that love, no matter how prodigal, can ill-perform every miracle. Still, whatever the reason, Paul would die of alcoholism in his early 30s, something that even today I find incomprehensible. We often talk about life and its possibilities. For those of us who have lost a brother, there seems a great gash in the universe. There was the world before, when whatever the world's verities, your brother was there participating, at times driving you crazy, at times making you mute with his daring. Often, when I am talking with parents at Cornell, trying to be the good advisor, knowing how much their children mean to them, the parents will, in an understandable moment of duress, worry that their child might not get accepted to a Harvard Business School or get the plum job on Wall Street. Sometimes, without meaning to, I'll stammer, is your child alive? For it is not a given. This, of course, is not what the parent wishes to hear. <laughs> and in ways, it seems a bit cruel. And yet, it is my most profound ministry. Make a big noise, my brother used to say, but he was resoundingly silent, moody, imperturbable, and not in the way of a monk or an aesthete, not in a way that is, that was serviceable. Paul was an activist, and was an activist. That is, you knew he loved you because he performed it. His body in its oscillations was his language. If you couldn't comprehend this, Paul was merely a cipher. In fact, if you didn't know this about him, if you didn't understand his inner life, that interiority that was as hard as an uncut diamond and just as murky, you might have even been scared of him for his solemnity might be perceived as truculence or anger, none of which was true. Yet if you are not easily comprehensible, if you do not fit into our facile categorizations, we stand ready with rocks at the stoning ground, which is why fear can always raise a mob, be it in Harlem or Seuss Falls. And Paul seemed a veritable lightning rod for others. Cops, as I've said, always found him irresistible. The headmaster of our school actually wondered if Paul was possessed. If you are among the elect today, someone must be relegated to the intellect. Paul, like hundreds of others, was not conscious of how his intermittent, woo, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Give me that hard man. <laughs> of how his indeterminacy influenced us. He was simply trying to live. But I remember him telling me he was very young, only five years old, two years after he made his initial pilgrimage to leave our house. People don't like me. And I recall how when we visited George Washington's home in Mount Vernon when he was age four, that lovely mansion high above the Potomac, which makes one understand tenaciously why this country fights for empire, Paul simply became prostrate at the entrance of the slave quarters, which was merely a mound of unadorned stones. I, for my part, was trying to fathom how Washington might throw a coin across the Potomac. Paul just slumped down as if constitutionally tired, as if the whole magnitude of the middle passage had settled upon him like a death mask. We thought he was sick. He didn't move for 10 minutes, 
It was not a temper tantrum. He was not unconscious. It was simply as if the enormity of the human devastation had entered him. When I was thinking about going to graduate school in my usual fit of anxiety, I told my brother that I was considering Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, a place I knew little about. Paul at the time was living in Harlem with my parents, half in college, half in chaos, playing his drums at local joints, drinking and smoking pot, and he was beginning to evidence that detachment that some found troublesome and others, women especially, found sweet. Paul was then an alcoholic, although I didn't truly understand the magnitude of his illness, and I would later fail him calling him at home instead of visiting, thinking of him instead of gathering him bodily up. Paul, like all addicts, knew how to outmaneuver us. I can't visit this weekend. I've got a gig, he'd say, when I asked him to come to Ithaca. He couldn't visit because I would not have let him drink, and he knew that. And in truth, he wanted to protect me. He knew that I would be overwrought, that whatever, whatever his dilapidation, I was even less available. Truth for us, sadly, was a marginal line that neither of us dare cross. And he was right. I would never truly make him ante up. I was too self-involved. To truly comprehend my brother's life, I was too self-infested. And even today, I rarely extend myself to others in the flesh. I'll give money for any cause. I'll write a letter to save near any living thing. But I find it impossible to put myself truly on the line to act. I don't visit people I love, even if I want to. I'm afraid of the telephone. I rarely make calls. I simply can't do it. So my own reticence, coupled with my brother's illness, made us both unapproachable. Can't get in the car, my brother yelled. He was looking fit, well-nourished, and happy, as vibrant as when he was seven, and chided me for liking Susie, a girl who charmingly would wait for me on her stoop from nine to three until I returned from school. That will never happen again. <laughs> I'm driving you from Ithaca to Providence. Get in. Paul had just driven 250 miles from Harlem to Ithaca, and now he was attempting to drive to Providence another 350 miles. And yet he did it. He drove carefully, said nary a word on the entire trip, and had his friends tell me about Brown. Tell my bro what this place has, he said. Don't dope it down. And then we slept for five hours, and he drove back to Ithaca, driving with the skill of a practice chauffeur. And once at my driveway, he literally thrust me out of the vehicle as, as if staying another minute might turn him into stone. Bro, you now know what to do. And then he drove back to New York City. He was ill then, but you wouldn't know it. That was Paul's way. I knew little of this when the murder occurred in front of our brownstone within a few feet of our small yard when Paul was eight. Paul had watched it through the first floor window, barely 25 feet from the crime. It was horrible. And my brother would never forget it, especially the sight of the victim's attempt at, ext at extracting the knife from his own chest. It was like he was trying to confirm his own murder, my brother would later say. Yet the policeman began his inter interrogation. He admonished my brother, I know you didn't see anything. And Paul, whatever else is demons, was not tone deaf. In Harlem in the 1950s, the police acted like gods, and my brother would never cower. As I was Paul's older sibling by two years, I was supposed to watch over him, which was more than a notion. As you might well imagine, Paul was little interested in my protection. I well recall Paul giving a patrolman the finger after the patrolman stopped his car, police car and asked him a minor question concerning his friend's whereabouts. Paul was merely age 10. The officer was bored. Since the officer was clearly not the least concerned about my brother's friends, 
three kids who could barely manage a pimple, he quickly returned to the patrol car. And yet Paul, who was then as thin as a car antenna, was itching for a fight. Paul didn't like the police, he didn't like their assumed superiority, and he didn't like to feel as if he were an ant dancing on a Cadillac, which the police, in their intemperate questioning, always seemed to demand of black people. When Paul's body tilted to the left and his head developed a slight upward inclination, I knew he was no longer interested in quiet palaver. And yet Paul was only 10, which meant that he knew everything and nothing. And this was America, and I was his brother. Suddenly, the officer jumped out of his vehicle, and I was certain that he had somehow intuited my brother's disparagement. If I was worried, my brother was boisterous. Paul stood up, looked the officer in the eye, and said, did you forget something? Your gun, maybe? <laughs> I was aghast. The cop looked at my brother, as if he had finally seen him, yet things were still unfixed, gauzy. This is a very dangerous moment for anyone, but especially for blacks and whites who know so little about each other, especially, that is, when one of them has a gun. You're crazy, the officer said, shaking his head as he walked away with that hip-strutting swagger, which is someone's idea of manliness. Undeterred, Paul just pointed at his head and slowly rotated his long fingers counterclockwise. Yeah, I'm crazy, asshole, he said. Linwood, who was only 16 when he killed that boy in our yard, was given a wide berth by everyone in the neighborhood. And my friends would try to hide, slinking in the alleys when he appeared. Linwood had an odd way of simply becoming present. There was a pause in the scenery. One of the tenants might be yelling a belated welcome to a passerby, and Lynn would materialize like an apparition, mayhem and horror, trailing in his wake. Lynn was malevolent, truculent, and brittle, and it seemed as if we were always in mid-sentence with him, as if the subject had been lost, but the verb was firing like a crazed piston, so that one might perceive the action, but not the content. One time, he brutally hit a boy for simply looking as if the boy had a question. Don't look stupid, Linwood yelled, and popped him in the head, the young boy's face appearing like a symbol of 20th century torrent, torment as the blood flowed down his chest. And yes, yet I also remember that Linwood presented my mother with a beautiful rose one Sunday morning. The rose was big, skyscraper tall as Fred, the neighborhood floriculturist termed it, though Fred was known for his hyperbole. Linwood never explained this lovely gesture my mother was simply undone by his generosity. Like so much that happened in those years, it didn't make much sense to me, or at least I did not try to understand it. My friends thought that Linwood had gone crazy. I simply thought that he liked my mother, which was not difficult, she, she, since she took everyone seriously, often bringing them a suite or praising some act of unheralded civic responsibility. My mother, for example, began a neighborhood preschool with mixed results. For a few weeks, the children came, but then a few of them discovered basketball. Then a few others, the local movie theater. In a few weeks, it was just my brother and I learning about the hidden treasures of Harlem. Yet people valued my mother's high principled affirmations, even if they found sustenance elsewhere. And my mother somehow saw something precarious and incandescent in Linwood. There's something sweet in him, she often said. After the Rose incident, I was determined to say hello to Linwood, thinking my acknowledgement might limit his possible scenarios for havoc. If you are constitutionally cowardly, it is best to take what little, whatever, whatever little fight you have immediately to the confrontation. Retreat will hasten soon enough. Yet Linwood never truly threatened me. In my case, thank goodness, it was merely all mouth. He was even gentle in his own peculiar way. One day, with a solemnity reserved for a parish priest, Linwood told me that he wanted someone out of Harlem. I'm going to die, he said. I'm going to continue to hurt people, he continued. The last, last statement is precisely enunciated as Julie Andrews' thrilling elocution in Camelot. I want you out of here, Linwood commanded. His entire body suddenly yawing between anticipation and dread, 
with a new evangelizing insistence that might even smash the ghetto. It so frightened both of us. A wish I now realized could be a dangerous thing. Then Linwood smiled, his face seeming to gather where his eyes were narrowing. And seeing how frightened I looked, he became contrite. Shit, I'm not going to kill you. You'll piss yourself to death. <laughs> and so Linwood, those 16, began to father me, a ritual where he would adopt me, which was his term, and make certain that I made something out of myself, go to college, which was Never mind that I had my own quite wonderful mother and father. That was immaterial. Linwood had made his decision. I was going to get out of Harlem. I was his one good thing, his one good act. During May and December, Lynn would appear, ask to see my grade report, and I'd hand it over, trying to make it look as if this was the most natural act in the world. <laughs> Luckily, I was a good student. In all honesty, in the early years, the school I attended rarely gave you grades. They provided long written responses, two paragraphs for each class. Linwood, as I recall, didn't read them. He'd simply tell me that I'm doing well, and so he didn't need to give me an ass whipping. In retrospect, it is even quite possible that Linwood had consulted the stars. He remained so ethereal. In my self-involvement, I really did not comprehend how much Linwood's gesture meant for him and for me. I did do well in school. My parents would not have otherwise, and I went on to graduate school and teaching at Cornell. And I didn't see Linwood until I learned that he had been sent to prison for killing an undercover cop, a crime that would necessi necessitate a death sentence. Hearing that he was on death row, I decided to visit him at Sing Sing Prison, a drive of three hours from Bukalik, Ithaca. I hadn't seen him in 20 years. He was thin, wiry, and unusually meditative, and he had that sharp bone figure that one immediately wants to feed, to fatten up, that look that my Aunt Josie used to call sparrow needy. For a moment, I couldn't conceive that he would have frightened anyone. I saw, I guess, for a second, what my mother gleaned in him, his unsullied sweetness. Ken, good to see you, Linwood said. But why did you come? Did you miss your ass whipping? <laughs> Immediately, I recalled the old Linwood. The body may change, but the mind does not. His remembering the one thing that I too well connected with him surprised me. And his elation reminded me that he was mercurial, that things could easily move from good to bad, from commonplace to perilous. I wanted to see you and thank you for helping me, I told him. He looked at me rather quizzically. I heard you're teaching at college, that you're married and doing good. That's something, he said. I wanted to say more, to explain how his investment in me suggested that there was something in him of great provender, something worthy, possibly even Augustinian in his bountiful complexity. But it was merely romantic, and it would have sounded hollow, paternalistic. Before I could even become more self-reproachably odious, he began to shuffle in his chair, looking as if he must have somewhere to go. This was not good for either of us. Then he stood up, and I saw how painfully thin he was. I had been there for merely five minutes. I hadn't even had time to contemplate the banal surroundings or compare the walls to the other prisons I had visited often giving poetry readings, where the inmates, if they didn't like the poems, at least liked that I took the time to visit with them. In such places, the gift of the unusual, even a dubious college teacher, was often life itself. Sing Sing, of course, was famous for its closeness to New York City, 30 miles up the Hudson, and its illustrious prisoners, Willie Sutton and Julius and Essel Rosenberg, and the fact that the same inmates who would later be housed within its walls constructed it. I found myself quickly looking around the table, seeing the gun tabs on the wall and the floor, the furious pencil markings on the desktop, a few ill-conceived numbers, possibly of a lawyer or a friend fitfully etched into the formica, the listing of a wife or a girlfriend who, more often than not, if not today or tomorrow, would refuse to return. I thought, too, of how many people I knew who had been sent up the river 
a term first fashioned in Sing Sing. There were more black people in prison than in college, and the numbers kept growing. The prison, sadly, had become America's true growth industry. Today, we make fast food and prisons, things that we can eat and things that eat us up, I recall a prisoner pundit stating. This is too much good news, Linwood told me. I didn't think anyone from the neighborhood would look me up, especially one who had escaped. The word escape seemed to hover misshapen in the air, like a leak in helium balloon, bulbous and addled, suddenly finding himself in a place where his language and experience had rarely taken him. I saw Linwood begin to stammer. The world seemed as stolid and indecorous as if it were made of plasterboard. I wanted language and entreaty. Linwood now was simply a prisoner waiting to die. Have a good life, he said. I watched as he walked through the gates and remembered how much he had frightened us, he merely 10 years our senior. People had often said that Lynn would kill for kicks, that he acted for no worldly reason, that he had no feeling for anybody. My brother Paul, years after seeing the killing, once tried to tell me that it wasn't Linwood who had done it. I don't think Paul was willfully misremembering. He was simply older. He too had found his future torturous. Things that had once made sense to him were oddly inchoate, disconsolate. And people in Harlem, as elsewhere, were full of contradictions. Yes, there were easy calls in my community. There was Larry who, from age three, always wanted to play house and wore dresses and would later be seen adorned with Vera Wang. He'd now be called a cross-dresser, but from the moment we first knew Larry, Larry was simply Larry, and all of us accepted him. Surprisingly, whatever else we didn't know about ourselves, and we were a veritable congress of commencements, Larry seemed oddly integrated and he would often stand as a beacon of discernment for us when things grew choppy. If suffering rarely makes one generous, it can make one wise. And it may be wrong to say Larry suffered. He, in fact, seemed self-assured, the only person in my community, paradoxically, who knew who he was. The rest of us were simply struck by the hammer. Larry, for example, told my brother that it was OK for him to drop out of college. It was OK to simply be a musician. Look at me, he said to my brother. Do you think I asked anyone for permission? Bro, Paul said, when I was younger, I once went to a bar on 138th Street, one of those funky places that scare people, the kind of place you writers like to imagine but would never be caught in, <laughs> the kind of place that even frightened me. He was silent for a moment, talking, I think, here for once truthfully to his brother, speaking, that is, in the way my parents had hoped he would have talked when they were alive, when he was most vulnerable. In the bar, I brought a bag of grass, and this big dude took my money, and then he said it wasn't enough, that I owed him for six bags. I wasn't a saint. I had purchased from him before, but I didn't owe him anything. That I knew. The guy was getting more anxious. He had a gun, and he wasn't interested in the money. He wanted to make a scene. He wanted to. Paul found himself scavenging for the word, looking towards the sky, as if the answer was present there. The word Paul compromised on was humiliate, a word that seemed oddly grandiose, but he employed it. He wanted to humiliate me. I wasn't into much, but I wasn't going to let this happen, my brother continued. And so I began to think about how I would hurt him, what I could do. I was looking at the bar, going through scenarios, most of them useless. Suddenly, Linwood appeared in the way he always did, seemingly coming from nowhere. Let me handle this, he said. And he took the pusher, pusher and rushed him out of the door. And I never saw him again. I don't know why I said it, but I told Linwood, please don't hurt him. Paul suddenly stopped talking and I hoped he would continue. But for someone who had rarely offered the slightest intimacy in speech, I knew that this was merely the first tentative voicing. Paul might say more. He might just as easily return to his vaulted privacy. Paul and I never returned to that moment. And so his short foray into speech seems like a sacrament. When he died from septicemia, 
after a very short stay in the intensive care unit of Roosevelt Hospital, where he never regained consciousness, my distraught parents asked me to gather up his few personal, personal articles. Paul had placed everything in a yellow plastic milk carton, neatly packed as if they were to be presented to someone of inestimable value. Everything pressed and folded, the things that he would once wear once he got well. There were two pairs of jeans, three pairs of socks, five pairs of undershirts, two t-shirts, a pair of beaten up Converse sneakers, none of which, of course, was ever used. And I had little to do. On the top of this haphazard Congress, looming like an epiphany, was the only article that was not clothing, a copy of my book of poems, To Hear the River, which I had dedicated to Paul. The poems, interestingly, alluded to James Baldwin's novel, Another Country, which centers on the death of Rufus, a black jazz musician, who would, in a fit of rage and self-hate, hurl himself off the George Washington Bridge and how his death implicated us all. My title celebrated the 24 times the Hudson River called like a siren to Rufus, presaging his demise, how Rufus' death tainted could not elude his fate. The novel asks, have any of us ever truly been present at our lives? When I had given my book to Paul, he simply nodded. In the two years he had it, Paul had never said a word. I thought he hadn't read the book or liked it. Like so much between us, it seemed simply to have fallen through the universe like something useless or immaterial. But there it stood on the top of that haberdashery like the earth's irrepressible language. What if I had never seen it? What if I had never looked at that haphazard totem of Paul's things? What if neither one of us had been born or had the other? If we, however, really, however fitfully and messily, had not loved one another. My parents now are dead, taken by Alzheimer's disease. I'm happily married and loved by a woman far better than I could ever imagine or deserve. I've taught a number of very fine students and helped a few of them go far farther than they or I ever thought possible. I've had wonderfully supportive friends and colleagues. It's been a good life. You're my brother, Paul Upton said. You're my brother, and both of us, in good and bad, whatever can be said about us, try desperately to understand what that implied, to take on the risk of presence at Baldwin retirement, to bear witness to what we did or did not do. Life is a chain of unalterable balances and failings, and it is also just as powerfully the tale of drive to Providence and Ithaca forays into dangerous clubs by ones who truly ventured there and by ones who could only venture there as an act of the imagination. And it is just as ineluctably a tale of grace of happenstance. What is, is. The last poem I published was about Paul. It was written 26 years ago. I haven't composed a poem since, and even there, no matter how much I wished it otherwise, he seemed to vanish. Thank you very much. I will read a number of poems today in honor of my family in New Orleans. I have actually a cousin who lives in the Ninth Ward, and I recently went to visit him, and he showed me a, quote, gift from Katrina, which was a gigantic watermelon. The watermelon was full of poisonous, toxic water. And I've always thought about this as being, in some sense, an apt metaphor for the ways in which the country responded to that ordeal. It was a horrific thing to happen to people, and this nation handled it in a way 
which suggested both that the people did not matter, and I'm talking about the people of New Orleans, New Orleans right? But that everything that we took as being sacred was in some sense not taken into account. So the poems I read today, I want to read to suggest, first of all, how important and dear everyone in New Orleans is to me and to this country and to the world, and to celebrate both the great jazz that comes from that part of the country, those incredibly resilient people who continue to make us wonder at what human beings are able to do and to survive and to triumph over, and to again my, remind us of what is really essential and sacred about the Afro-American tradition, which is one of saying yes to life when it seems absolutely impossible. So this is for all of those survivors who have taught us how mighty we can be in the face of the most calamitous thing imaginable. And may we continue to teach people what is really, truly essential about human beings. And also, may we always be mindful of the fact that no one ever got here on his or her own, that all of us, in some sense, have to remain witnesses for each other. That's the greatest act of faith and love and celebration. And this is my small attempt, very small attempt, to repay a community that has given me and so many others so much. To hear the river for Langston Hughes. I should also say that Langston was someone I knew as a kid. He's actually responsible for me becoming a poet. To the, to the chagrin, I think, of some members of my family who hoped I'd get a real job. But anyway, here's the poem. To hear, to hear, to hear the strong black song, to hear it, to hear the river, is to know its ways, to know the gaunt thin source which somehow, like Hughes, becomes long black water, becomes so that much might come after it, a handhold, a griot. And so long black song comes dark, provident, absolute. And finally coming to the river, facing the dogs and white men, facing what is lost and possible, we hear the river, we hear the river, we hear the river. The next poem has a very odd title. 1619 to 1979 is a large time. It is a large time, but the important date there, obviously, is 1619, when the first black people came to the shores, and they didn't come on a luxury liner. One, when we came here, we knew it would not be easy. Our language looked for a star, a galaxy, something to give us a dim penetration. When we understood, many of us lost ourselves. Two, this morning was a blue morning. Not a thing seemed rich or outlandish, my spirit dry as a man inched up with heroin. This morning, I thought I might never leave here. Three, I count the blues. I count each and every one of them. Children ask me what I recall, remember. I remember their mother's bellies. I remember how small grew those ships which brought us here. Four, I count the blues. I count each and every one of them. Five, here our children meet death as one might the sun. When we understood, many of us lost ourselves. Six, children ask me what I recall, remember. 
I leave from a boat, move to a great land, and wander a newer forest. Seven, the blue shall set you free, the blue shall set you free, the blue shall set you free, but I've been here so long. I've always wished that I was a horn player. Um, I think most writers wished they were musicians. So this is as close as I can get. And I'm reading it very mindful that this is centered on people who probably know more about the music that has in some sense created this great country than anywhere else on this planet. So this is for jazz and New Orleans, and also, of course, for Sonny Stitt, the glowworm. The glowworm works up the barren limb like a fragile index of the world. This is not his poem. He sings for himself. The poem here is the singing of the glowworm, how he struggles up the next section of bark, stretching like an accordion his mind seething with his body's thumbless design. But this is not his poem. It is about lovers. It is about sound and sense and sound sense. Innocence, incense, innocence. It is about games and lovers. It is about the struggle to be perfect, to make that love inviolable sacred. It is about the poet who needs language, who needs the world, who needs words to love him. It is about love, vast love, love of meanings love. It is about the soul which speaks beyond sense, which flushes like a quail after a startling. It is about love, the love of the smallest darting, the imperfect journey, the glow, glowing glowworm, worthy of itself and worthy then of singing. Mm -hmm.